Hey guys, so I've got another question and answer video for you today. I know it's been some time since you left your questions, but uh, I will be getting through them. I certainly haven't forgotten. It's just, I guess, with all these Ubuntu releases, I've been a little bit preoccupied. But today's question comes from friend of the show, Andre, who has asked questions before, but this one is particularly insightful and asked in a particularly well-worded um, way, actually, because usually when this question gets asked on this channel, it's usually by someone who is trying to make a point rather than ask an actual question. But um, Andre here has actually uh, contextualized the question really well. He's talked about some of the uh, sides that he, he's looked at. Anyway, well, I'll just um, I'll read the email. So, um, I saw a lot of Linux users have stopped using Google and its services, Gmail, Google Docs, and so on. Most of them have switched to DuckDuckGo and other services. What do you think about it? Are you using Google, for example, search engine and its services? If so, does it mean you don't really care about privacy and such things, right? I'm just curious. I'm not a privacy-centric person. I'm not paranoid about privacy. I don't have anything serious to hide. I don't visit suspicious websites. I'm just a Linux user who plays games occasionally. I talked with a Linux user who's working for Google, and he says they already have um, every pave of information about there there is to know. Google does tend to track a lot of our activity. Now, the truth is Google's browsers, uh, Google's browser and services work best. At least that's my opinion. I'd rather stick with what works best. Now, I'm undecided. I see different opinions and ideas. Of course, I care about privacy of things I don't want to be public, but I don't have any intention of being a ghost on the internet. Anyone can find out my full name and email. My full name is even posted on my high school's website. Some people are paranoid about privacy, and I don't know if I should be too. I have one more question. How are you dealing with YouTube? Having a YouTube channel requires a Gmail account and you're not using Gmail anymore as I can see. Um, thanks again. I look forward to your reply. Have a nice day. Well, thank you, Andre. Um, I'm just going to answer the last one, uh, last part of that question a little bit quickly. Um, actually, you can remove the uh, Gmail part of your Google account from the rest of it. You can actually sh completely shut down the Gmail account. Uh, in if you go to accounts.google.com. So I still use my Postio as my primary email account for these kind of things. It's not the one, it's not my public facing one, of course, um, but I do, I still use Postio as my primary email provider. They cost one euro a month. Um, they uh, power all of their infrastructure with renewable energy. They pay their workers a fair wage and they even provide uh, their staff a free lunch, which I think is you know, in, in this day and age where you've got Amazon pushing people to the brink of exhaustion, uh, I find Postio is just a nice respite from that. And well, you know, I know some people will object to paying one euro a month for email, but I, I think that um, I, I am willing to make that sacrifice personally. You can even pay in cash with Postio. Obviously, they're uh, not a sponsor because I don't really run sponsors on this channel. But um, I don't know. I've got some thoughts on sponsorships for, but that, that one's going to be for a different video. Um, but yes, um, I think when it comes to just myself, the Google services that I use are just YouTube. I think I might have some Google Analytics accounts for some websites that I'm vaguely associated with that I barely ever use. But um, that's more of a tied in with work thing rather than a personal choice thing. Um, so I'm going to work through this um, this email step by step and also talk a little bit about the culture of privacy in the Linux community and, and also in the tech community and certain options that we have. But it is important to bear in mind that it is not a world of absolutes here. Uh, you can choose your level of engagement with Google services or, in fact, services of, with any any company. So there's, you know, for me, there's an entire, entire world of difference between using Google to manage every aspect of your digital life or just using them for the one-off service. So if you just use Gmail because you think it's the best email provider or if you just use the Chrome or Chromium browser because you think it's the best browser or you use the Google search engine because you think it's the best search engine, that's all well and good. But when you start using all of these services, you kind of are handing over a lot of power to Google because they're managing a very large part of your digital life. And especially when you multiply that with the number of people that use Google services. Now, when it comes to the data collection side of Google, 
That's actually secondary to the business practice side of Google. What really scares me about Google, I think this genuinely horrifies me, and it's less about Google, it's more about the human race, is how Google is so synonymous with the acquisition of knowledge. It is absolutely fucking terrifying if you think about it. That there is this one website that we don't even know how it works, that we've brought into our verbiage, our nomenclature, there's a fancy word for you, that, you know, to Google is a verb. And even that sort of works its way into the public mindset to think that, that, that Google, to Google, so you go to google.com. If you have a question, if you, if you lack any kind of knowledge, you go to google.com and you just ask it a question and it can give you the best question that humankind can come up with. Now that, is a miracle. Let's let's make no bones about it. It's it's the fact that, that, that we have these little black mirrors where we can ask it any question we want. There is no question too dumb, and boy, does the internet ask some dumb questions. But there is no question so dumb that you can't get an answer out of it. But the fact that we keep turning to this one company, this you know, and, and, it, and its job is to make money, and not only is its job to make money, but it's a company that has been sued for 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 malpractice in the business world for act, uh, actually manipulating its search results illegally according to European law, and the entire world, or at least the majority of the you know the connected world, is using this one website to rely on for all its knowledge requirements, and that is a bottleneck worse than anything else I can imagine on the internet, because it's it's this idea that w the, the maybe even the majority of human knowledge at this point is being funneled through one website. That it's become this, you know, vanguard of enlightenment. And it's... And, and what, what I feel is the, the, the remedy to this is diversity. It's kind of like relying on one one make of encyclopedias or one publishing institution to to acquire all of our information from or or it's like getting all your news sources from from one newspaper it's it's you know it, it's not a reliable way to interpret information from the world so the reason I use I actually use uh circs or that's what I call it uh, s e a r x dot me and I'll put a link to it down in the description. And it is basically just a proxy website. It's open source. It's one of the very few open source browsers. And it's not really a browser. It is a proxy for Google, for Bing, for DuckDuckGo. And you can actually customize it really, really well. It gives you a whole load of customization options. So you're affirmatively telling you, or you're, affirm you're affirmatively telling it, uh, you know, how you want it to conduct its search results, where you want it to search sources, all that kind of stuff, without it having to guess on algorithms and, and monitoring your behavior and uh, and all that. And it gives you a much more objective list of results because what Google gives you is very much a reflection of the information that it has on you. Your browsing history, you know, YouTube history. Uh, there was a time when it scanned through emails. But in reality, uh, in my time working with computers, you can actually garner a huge amount of information from a person from actually very little metadata. So when we talk about Google wriggling itself into all facets of our lives, it doesn't need to do that. It, it, it just needs to know what football team we support, what film we saw at the cinema last weekend. And from all of this seemingly arbitrary information, it can join the dots and it can actually just work out a really good picture of, of, of who we are to the point where advertisers can now come in and quite um, worryingly manipulate us with largely specific advertising. And I'm, I'm remembering an article, I think it was written maybe about a year ago by Tim Berners-Lee. And he actually, maybe actually, I think it might even be more than a year ago. And I'm going to try and dig it up and and um, and link that as well, uh, where he talks about the, you know, the specific nature of advertising, for example, allows a politician to have two simultaneous stances. For example, let's just take the issue of, of, of gun control, right? Because that's nice and non-controversial. But, uh, you know, if I was a politician, I could I could say, well, anyone who likes the, the NRA, 
uh, Facebook web, web page. Well, I, I will send out an advert to them and I will say, I am in favor of guns, guns for everybody. But then, you know, I like, you know, for, for everyone who likes the Facebook page, I don't know, Mothers Against Guns or whatever it is. Uh, well, I'll tell them that I will ban all the guns, you know, and, and you can tell you can tell two simultaneous lies to two entirely groups of people. Because I highly doubt that Mums Against Guns and the NRA go to picnics together. Maybe they do, but it's probably a few fringe cases. And by and large, as you know, a politician can, can completely fabricate an entire set of policies from one group to another. And I'm going to leave it up to you as to whether or not that's, you know, done or could be done. And the fact that it could be done is probably, you know, concern enough that the, the door to abuse is, 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 is wide open there. Um, and I'm not going to, you know, and, and, and to think it's just it's just a, a vulnerability. It's not necessarily a, it's a psychological vulnerability, if nothing else. And then imagine, of course, how it might affect children. And that's when it really starts to worry me, because, um, you know, as an adult, I can imagine myself as a critical individual, although truth be told, the vast majority of, of human beings are subject to just as many biases as any other human beings. But um, but but with children who are still developing a grasp on the world, who are still learning things at a very new rate, are actually now, you know, c can be, I don't know, they, it, it just seems like there is there is far too much to take advantage of there when it comes to that kind of thing. And it seems that there is a better way. Now, let's multiply that with the Google browser, the window in which you view the internet so that you can ask the Google website the very question to fill in the knowledges that you don't have. And it doesn't, you know, become long before Google is now managing your communications. It's managing your entertainment through YouTube and Google Music. It's managing its information through Google.com. Um, you know, and it's even managing your punctuality with Google Calendar. And whereas Google, in my opinion, is probably the best out of the big, big data companies to actually just submit yourself to it, that completely uh, puts yourself in a very vulnerable position. It puts yourself in a position open to abuse because, yeah, maybe Google is, is one of the better companies. Um, it's, it does seem to have reasonably good uh, policies when it comes to their environmental impact, for example. They allow you to download all of the data that you have given to Google over the years. Um, you can turn off uh, YouTube history. You can. You know, there are a lot of privacy controls in Google, more so than there are on Amazon, more so than there are on Microsoft, more so than there are on Yahoo, Verizon, or whatever that company is nowadays. And although I'm not particularly familiar with Apple as a company, um, so I'm not even going to comment on that. Um, and I probably have a few separate thoughts on Apple as well. Um, but because Apple do tend to use a different business model, I don't necessarily believe it's fair to lump them in with the, the Googles and the Microsofts and the Facebooks of, of the world. So, yeah, like I say, Google are the best out of a complicated bunch, but it is still better to diversify. So I do use YouTube. And to say that Google is evil and you should never touch Google would make me a blatant hypocrite. Um, and I can certainly concede that... Uh, I, well, I can certainly see why many people would consider Chrome or Chromium to, to be the best browser. Although I do have to say with Firefox, what are they up to? The Firefox 59 now? I'm using that on a, on a daily basis and uh, I have no problems with it whatsoever. But I do keep the Chromium browser in a snap because there are a few browser add-ons that aren't available on Facebook that um, I do use for, for work purposes. And so I do have a, a glancing you know, view of, of the Google browser from time to time. And I've got to admit it does run probably about as best as any other browser. Uh, but that, yeah, but, but, but with Firefox 59, that nowadays runs just as well actually like when it, back in the days of firefox 57 it was um there was definitely you know you could definitely tell that chrome was or chrome slash chromium was was the faster browser so to bring this uh, around to privacy um now this is where it kind of gets complicated because everyone has a different level of privacy that they're comfortable with um, if you were really that much of a privacy advocate, you probably wouldn't connect to the internet except in the very rare occasions where you absolutely needed to, and then you disconnect as soon as possible. Or maybe you'd use the um, Tails OS, which is a, what's referred to as an amnesic live distribution, where you boot off of a USB or CD, you use an operating system which will reset itself on every reboot, it connects through the, uh, the Tor network, and it browses every website about as anonymously as you can imagine. But uh, and I've never tried using this as a workflow, but I'm quite certain that if you actually relied on the um, Tails OS as your day-to-day -day working environment, you would probably face more than a few obstacles. So, 
privacy is is a is a spectrum and uh, and it's important to find a place that you feel quite comfortable with it. I'm clearly obviously not that much of a privacy centric person that I'm actually making videos sharing my thoughts on the internet uh, with you, you know, under my real name, using my real face, presumably. I mean, I guess you guys don't know for sure, but it would make me one heck of a heck of a video editor. How do you do that on Caden Live, eh? With the lips moving and everything. But no, yeah. So, and um, and even in my local community, I live in a very small, close knit community. So, privacy is really nothing that I, I, I it's nothing that I've I've ever grown used to because it's nothing that I've ever really, it's never been a part of my life. But it's really important, really important that those of us that don't really have much regard for our personal privacy still can uh, still um, sort of uh, we still have to make sure that those that require privacy or those that need it still have access to it. It's important that we don't foster a culture of peeping toms where if you've got nothing to hide, then you've got nothing to fear. Because that, to me, is an incredibly dangerous road to go down, where anyone who does desire privacy is then treated with suspicion. And to those ends, I think that it's worth people like myself, who don't really care about privacy, then adopting some good practices when it comes to privacy, uh, and like not giving information that isn't required at every opportunity, or to at least advocate for privacy respecting services so that those services are then supported and then people who might be who might require them in a more severe way for example if you are an lgbt activist in 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 russia or in egypt you know there is a good chance that you might need privacy services to to protect yourself or um you know or any number of um of places around the world and the open source community has a long history of actually making uh, very um, very robust software to actually protect people in times of all kinds of political turmoil and that's uh, that's a great badge of honor that sh we should all wear and it's certainly nothing that we should lay down for the sake of convenience um, because yeah those of us that are able to 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 you know stand and proclaim our views out in the open you know we're the lucky ones but there are people that you know have to hide in the shadows uh for no justifiable reason and those are the people that need to be protected i mean all i you know all, you, all we've got to th think about now is the case of count dankula who basically got convicted of a hate crime for telling a nazi joke which uh and it, and he was even looking at prison time for that which to me i find horrifying right i have like that is horrifying is the right word like it's genuinely scared me um and looking at the law and looking at how it's written and looking at how the call was made and looking at the whole situation and i think british people need to be damn fucking scared and it's like yes we need uh protections like this because what happens if our situation escalates what happens with you know when anyone with an unsavory joke or an unsavory opinion gets threatened with fucking prison time you know and this is this is why these kind of protections are needed it's all too easy to imagine that extreme authoritarian regimes are a thing of the 20th century but they are so fucking not and fascism doesn't come goose stepping in its little uniform it doesn't it comes through the back door through slimy politicians trying to find an easy way out uh, and um and we need to protect ourselves from that shit we need to protect ourselves because privacy is worth protecting because you never know when you really fucking need it when when your government turns against you and you're on the run for it in fact uh hank green uh, of vlog brothers fame actually made a really interesting video about cannabis legalization and he summed it up by saying if a substance that doesn't really cause any harm in fact helps a lot of people is illegal and the government is going actively going after people for for using this substance which is for all intents and which is harmless to society you kind of have to face facts that the government isn't really on your side And that sort of bears thinking about that 
maybe it feels like it's on your side today because all of the opinions you have are acceptable. But, you know, this is 2018. If, you know, the last few years have taught us anything, it's that the world is unpredictable and anything that we hold dear can disappear in the blink of an eye. Don't matter what country you live in for that one. Um, so, I'm going to try and round off on maybe a slightly more of an upswing. But like I say, it's important to use what you feel comfortable with. Um, but there is more to the world than just what runs the fastest, the what's the easiest to use. And I think a lot of it is uh, when you say, you know, you'd, you'd rather stick with what's best. What's best could mean anything. Um, a lot of people think Windows is what's, is what's best because it's what's easiest. Uh, some people think Linux is best because it gives you more control or security or performance. But again, it depends. What's best is what fulfills your needs the best, I guess. And I live in a community where there are a significantly large number of, of older folks who don't really have too much of a care for technology, least of all how it works, but they understand that this is where the world is going. And uh, among these, the, this, this demographic, you'll find a lot of Mac users, people who would be more than happy to spend £1,200 on a computer, which to me is really quite expensive because I'm used to building my own computer from parts. But to a lot of people who might have, you know, might have the money to spend on it, £1,200 is an acceptable amount of money for a tool that does a job competently. And a lot of people, a lot of older people around here, actually really like Macs because they've taken a lot of the, the, the pain out of learning how to use a computer. That They're actually just very user-friendly, very simple devices for doing very simple tasks. That is not a computer designed for me. I like to tear stuff apart, look at how it works, make it work in different ways, and then, you know, all that kind of stuff. I like Linux because it gives me more control. They like Macs because it gives them more simplicity. And I often use the analogy with vehicles. Uh, a lot of people in the UK, the vast majority of people in the UK, drive a manual transmission, a, a stick shift. And um, and my parents drive uh, stick shifts, or they've driving, been driving stick shifts uh, for the overwhelming majority of their lives, and they they love it because it gives you that that level of control over the car. In fact, I live in a part of uh, where I live. The roads are actually very, very, very dangerous. We have a very, very high death toll on the roads, and uh, the weather only makes that worse when it's when it's frosty, when it's snowy, when it's when it's wet, and there's a lot of you know when there's mud on the road, that causes a lot of problems. And being able to shift down into a, a slower gear where you've got a bit more, you know, grip on the road, a bit more control on the road. Yeah, you might have to go slower, but you can sort of weather through difficult terrain on a manual a lot more efficiently than you can on an automatic because you've just got that extra level of control on the car. I have not been driving as long as my parents, but I did learn to drive a stick. But the first time I got into an automatic, oh, it's so easy. Those cars practically drive themselves. Now, of course, it's obvious to see why my parents would prefer driving a stick and why I would prefer driving an automatic. I am not a, certainly not a car enthusiast by any stretch of the imagination. I'm looking for what's easiest. Therefore, automatic gearboxes work best for me. But my parents have been driving for years. They can drive a manual just as easy as they can drive an automatic, and they just prefer that level of control. So it's just, you know, different perspectives coming at the same, you know, solving the problems. And actually, in regards to Apple and Mac, when it comes to privacy, um, I don't know much of them, um, much about them as a company, but I've actually heard quite a lot of security experts say that an iPhone is really just as secure as an Android, especially if you take an iPhone compared to a, an Android that doesn't get updates anymore, you're better off with the iPhone because there, uh, and I, in fact, I even think that the iOS kernel is open source at this stage. Uh, and there are, in fact, plenty of, a lot of open source components in the uh, the iOS phone. And, um, but yeah, I, I actually hear a lot of security advocates say that, that, that an iPhone is really, you know, if you want, like, like uh, mobile phones and smartphones, they're insecure by design. But if you wanted the best out of a bad bunch, in that league would be uh, would be iPhones. Now, again, I'm not a security expert, and I'm certainly not an iPhone expert. But, um, but from the people who I trust on these kind of issues and for the uses that they have, um, it does seem that um, 
that there is a, a, a genuine use case for, for things that, that aren't Linux. <laughs> Chris comes this weird realization. There are other operating systems that are kind of good apart from Linux, maybe. I don't know. I use Linux because I enjoy Linux. It's, it, it works the way that I want it to. Um, and, and Linux allowed me to learn about computers in a time when I just couldn't afford to elsewhere. So I always owe this huge personal debt uh, to Linux. Um, that the, I, I, you know, that I find it very difficult to explain to other people because it's like, uh, you know, it helped me build my business. I couldn't, you know, and it helped me build my my career straight out of university because I, I, I couldn't afford all these software components that needed, uh, that I needed, and um, and um, yeah, like open source helped me at a time when I, I needed it the most, and and part of this is why I dedicate this channel to sort of cheerleading, uh, Linux and, and open source because. You know, it helped me at a time when I needed it most, and now it's to me it's only fair that I, I, you know, I, I bring to light um, the best that that it, that it can offer, and and that's why I try and refrain from from doing too much negative stuff on this channel. If there's a distribution that I just don't think cuts the mustard, I'm much more likely to shelve it as a video than I am to do an, a negative review. Um, but that is a little. That's probably one for. Um, probably one for another day. I guess the essence of my proposal is not to consider privacy for how it might serve oneself, but how it might serve society. I don't want to foster a culture of peeping Tom governments, of peeping Tom corporations, or just peeping Toms. I want to maintain privacy as a perfectly acceptable value in society. I don't want people who are shy or who do not want to share every detail of themselves to be considered suspicious. And that's why whenever I can, whenever it works for me, I choose to to use privacy respecting services and, and conduct myself in, in, in that way. And I know that I'm a more transparent person than most, which is why I'm perhaps not the best person to champion such a cause. Maybe I am. Maybe this is because, you know, people who, who need the privacy the most can't speak out for themselves. I'm just going to say, uh, say, say how I see it, really. But um, but yeah, like I say, there's, I think there are wider benefits to maintaining a, a, a you know, privacy friendly culture. Um, but that being said, just because you use a handful of Google services does not mean you've thrown that out of the window. Um, from what I can recollect right now, Google probably have one of the better track records when it comes to uh, maintaining and protecting your data. And I will always personally reserve that probably for most use cases, the best way of maintaining your data is just to simply have offline backups. Statistically speaking, uh, you're more likely to lose something on the cloud than your house is to burn down. So if you've got a solid backup system at home, then, um, the, you know, like an, a decent encrypted self-hosted storage solution doesn't need to be particularly complicated. It could just be an external hard disk drive that you keep in a different room. The chances of, of houses burning down these days to the point where all of your data would, would completely disappear is incredibly small. And also additionally, probably if your house is burnt down, you know, you, you've got more to worry about there. Uh, anyhow, um, and there are also off-site backups and, uh, and other things as well. Um, but um, again, it's it's, um, it's solutions that work for you, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a Google service. Um, and it's also important to bear in mind that Google is 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 certainly not the only company that um, that have creeping practices when it comes to privacy. They also have a lot of controls, so I would encourage those of you that that, that can, or at least can be asked, to, to have a look at some of the privacy settings in Google, because they're worth a look and you can turn off a lot of stuff that you don't use. There's no point in giving Google information that it doesn't need. Um, so I do actually, you know, for all its faults, actually have quite a high regard um, for Google as a company, certainly when you compare it, uh, what, to Amazon? You know, like Amazon is a shite company. Um, says the guy that, that, that streams on there. But yeah, it is like, you know, so, um, and, and if I could, you know, yeah, like Google is a better company than Amazon. Google's a better company than Microsoft in, you know, in, in, from, from what I can see there. So, um, I hope I've given you some sort of food for thought, but, um, if you're looking for, to get away from Google services, um, I hear a lot of people speak highly of ProtonMail, um, as a open source privacy respecting, um, 
email service. I'm a big fan of Postio if you're willing to pay for it. If you want your own domain, there's Gandhi.net, which actually do make significant contributions to the uh, open source community, and they can actually uh, they actually let you have an email um, service associated with your own domain. You just buy the domain, and they give you I think it's two email accounts for free now. Um, so that's pretty good. It's not as full featured as some of the other email um, providers out there, but it's uh, very cost effective. Cost effective is very cheap, and um, and you can get lots of different domains there uh, really well. And they do quite a lot of special offers. If you're looking for a uh, quite an easy um, email service as well that I think offers quite good encryption protections, gmx.com is also quite good. They offer, I think it's Dane, uh, called Dane Encryption, which I believe is an end-to-end -end email encryption, if I'm not mistaken, um, that Postio also uses. Um, but unfortunately, not that many other email services do use it, but apparently it's like the best um, available encryption, but because it allows you to uh, work out if the person you're emailing it to has it encrypted on their end as well. So it's kind of the the end-to-end the -end factor there, which is really good, but uh, unfortunately, not that many email services make use of it. So, um, But GMX does, so they are... Um, and I know a few techies that do use GMX, so that's... Uh, and I've used them. I've used their free service uh, a few times, and it's yeah, it's 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 pretty good. It's not as open source um, as as some of the other ones that I've listed, but um, if that's you know, it is what it is. So um, I think as well the Firefox, the latest Firefox browser is pretty good. Um, when it comes to cloud services, I I tend to just go with the old LibreOffice and do the offline thing. Um, but I don't collaborate much on documents. So um, Google, but Google Docs lets you download all your documents in one fell swoop as well. So Google Docs is pretty good in, in, in terms of that regard. I do actually quite like DuckDuckGo as a search engine. In fact, if you use DuckDuckGo and it's not giving you the results that you wanted, what you can do is you can add an exclamation mark G to the end of your search and it will then just search in Google for you. So what you can do is you can use DuckDuckGo as your de facto search engine but when it when it struggles you can then just there's a very easy way to switch over to Google just by um, uh, exclamation mark G and I think there's exclamation mark W which also does Wikipedia. So um, yeah like DuckDuckGo have a few features that actually work quite well um, with other ways of, of uh, aggregating information. Uh, with Cirques.me, it is just a... Uh, what I quite like about it is that it takes results from Bing, it takes results from Google, DuckDuckGo, and other search engines that you can um, draw in, and it actually sources them for you. So it goes, oh, here's a result from Google, here's a result from Bing, here's a result from DuckDuckGo. So it does act as a neutral proxy, which I quite like, but it also is reasonably transparent. And also, uh, Cirques is open source and encourages you to host it on your own server if you have the ability and expertise to do so. So there are more, and in fact, it even includes a list of other installations of Cirques. So um, that's really cool as well. Also, um, a lot of the times it's, when I decide not to use a Google service, sometimes it's just um, that I, you know, sort of want to support um, another company that's sort of uh, up and coming or doing things a little bit differently as well. And it's not necessarily that I feel like I'm being pushed away by Google. Um, so yeah, like I say, I think d diversity is the name of the game here. Use what Google services you can't live without and for everything else, there's, uh, there's open source, I guess. And that tends to be the philosophy that I go on. I think that it's incredibly unhelpful to be overly critical of other people's software choices because... Um, you know, what goes around comes around. I mean, I don't use the most, you know, I don't use the Libra Linux kernel. I don't use uh, exclusively open source software on my, my Linux distribution. So for me to be an open source zealot would, again, you know, it, it, it drifts into the realms of hypocrisy. I'm just the, you know, the kind of person that's like, yeah, move forward on progress when you can. Um, and, and just, you know, be, be cognizant of, 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 you know, try not to move backwards, I guess. Um, so there, yeah, that's just, just my thoughts on it. But, um, yeah, like, use what you feel, you know, comfortable and happy with. Make sure you read the terms and conditions, I think is probably, um, the most important there. Uh, last time I read Google's terms of service, 
uh, they seem to be reasonably easy to get through. So uh, it doesn't seem too bad in, in, in that regard. And um, yeah, just make sure that you know what privacy controls are set on your Google account and, um, and uh, you know, just learn the competition, I guess. So just to round off the video, I'm going to share a thought on, on YouTube that doesn't really get shared that often. Now, I've been watching videos on YouTube since near enough since, since the platform became... Um, in the public knowledge, maybe about 2006, 2007. And, uh, and, you know, I started off like most people do watching music videos or clips of Family Guy or whatever, uh, which used to be like the only things that were on YouTube back in the day. And then, you know, it diversified and grew as a platform. And in many ways, actually, it hasn't really changed that much. And the kind of accusations that are being leveled against YouTube today were being leveled against YouTube 10 years ago. So I guess the more things change, the more they stay the same in that regard. Um, I think it is such a shame that they hold such a monopoly on community generated content, not on the corporate stuff. You've got Netflix and Hulu and in the UK, we've got iPlayer and Sky Atlantic and all this kind of stuff. You know, you know, we're not short of, um, of of content providers here, but when it comes to like community stuff, videos like this, YouTube is really, it's really like the the only platform that has it. It has that 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 true uh, essence captured, and it's not because it can host so much video. Uh, I mean, that's part of it, but really. The value that it brings to content creators and content viewers is discoverability. I can put my videos up on any platform, any other platform, and it would only ever get a fraction of the views that this channel would get. And to compound that, the majority of the views that my videos get are from people who aren't subscribers. So it's not even a subscriber issue. Now, I will say that judging from the analytics, it does seem that my view count at some points in the year is very, very, very consistent, like interestingly consistent. There's like a, a line of subscribers and the subscribers watch videos at the constant rate that you would expect subscribers to watch videos at. But what's interesting is that there is a constant rate of non-subscribers watching the video. So it does seem that YouTube is funneling viewers into my content at a pre-prescribed amount. And it does seem to be, like, well, okay, if the channel's a bit more active, then it seems to funnel more in. Even if the videos that, are at, that I'm making aren't necessarily the most popular ones, it seems that the algorithm is more concerned about me being active than it is about me being relevant. And that's kind of interesting. In certain ways, at certain times, as long as I'm not irrelevant for too long. You know, all that kind of stuff. And it works. And, and the, the algorithm, no one knows how it works because it's a self-programming algorithm, from what I've been told. But... Um, but when it comes to YouTube, it's the discoverability that really um, make it, it, its value because I could host these videos uh, on, on my own server. Perhaps it would cost a little, but I'm I'm sure that the, the revenue would come for it from, from somewhere or, you know, and, and Patreon host um, the audio versions of a lot of my videos as well without too much of an issue there. So, but it's the discoverability. It's the, like people will discover me on YouTube and they might move, you know, find me over on other platforms subsequently. But the, the overwhelming majority of people have, have uh, watched my content on, on YouTube. Now, I'm certainly not going to close anyone else out. That's why my channel's mirrored on BitChute. That's why I put, you know, audio versions of many of these videos up on uh, Patreon for free, by the way. Everything up on my Patreon is, is for free. So it's worth checking out from time to time. If you if there's like a long video. Uh, similar to this, that you just want to download an MP3 and listen on the way to work or something, then you can do that. Um, I think it's absolutely ridiculous for someone like me to put stuff behind a paywall because I advocate for free and open source software and I'm a cheerleader for free and open source software. It's like, oh, you can hear me cheerlead for this as long as, it, you know, you, you pay a certain amount. That's ridiculous, man. So, um, and also as well, it's worth going to my Patreon page because it has a list of the, the people who I sponsor. So the uh, so I do a bit of paying paying it forward. So um, one of the things I like about this channel is that you know I go out and find open source uh, programs that are good, and then I bring them to you, and then you know you guys can inspect them, have a look at them, see if you you know they have any value for you. Um, do so, yeah. So with the Patreon, it's it's a similar thing. There is a list of the channels that I support. 
Uh, they're usually Linux orientated. I think Ubuntu Mate is there, Solus is there, but, you know. And uh, it's not particularly, you know, I'm not a big donator because I'm not a rich person. But um, yeah, like I, there, there is a list of projects that I support and I encourage you to have a look at them. And if you can afford to do so, support them yourselves because they do a lot of good work um, or, you know, but but I'll, I'll let you assess their value um, on your own, of course. But um but uh, like I say, open source helped me out at a time when no one else would. So, you know, I, I owe this great personal debt to it that's maybe irrational and illogical to some. But um, but hey, you know, at least it's not a debt owed to the mafia or something like that. So um, so just to wrap it up as well, uh, there has been talk about YouTube not getting out to all the subscription inboxes. So... Uh, if you check the links down in the description of this video, there'll be a whole host of links, ways you can support the channel, ways you can view the channel. Um, quite far down, I, I, I'll try and remember to move it to the top, is uh, my WordPress site. It's called chriswareupdates.wordpress.com. And it, all, everything that I put up uh, in terms of video and, and, and sound content from Patreon, all that kind of stuff, gets mirrored over onto my WordPress channel. So what you can do is if you want to make sure that you can you can subscribe to that WordPress blog either through email or RSS and that way you will you know you'll definitely be made sure of uh, if there's a video or you can trust you know uh, YouTube's Russian roulette system of the notification I don't know do any of you guys click the notification bell I'd be interested um, and uh, of course don't forget to smash that like button because <laughs> you gotta you gotta smash it haven't you um, just gently tapping it is not good enough but smash it but uh, yeah you do that um, because I don't, does it do something? I don't even think I don't even think the likes do anything to be honest. But there you go. Anyway, so I'm getting a bit mad now because it is late and I should be going to bed. But I'm probably gonna gonna we're gonna edit this video before I do so. Anyway, enough of my ramblings. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. These videos always have the best comments. And um, thanks to Andre for the insightful and intelligent comment. Um, I hope I wasn't on my soapbox a little bit too much because I'm a deeply flawed human being and uh, nothing I should ever say be taken as absolute. In fact, one of the reasons I actually really enjoy making videos for you guys um, is because you do think with your own mind and you do call me out when I talk shit and, um, and I can't get anything past you anyway. So, <laughs> so there's that. Anyway, like I say... Uh, Take all that information as you um, as you like it, and uh, until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome. Take care now. Yeah. You said gas was used 23 times. What's funny about that? The context of it is the juxtaposition of having an adorable animal react to something vulgar. That was the entire point of the joke. Have you seen the video? Do you accept you committed a crime? Have you seen the video? I have. Right, again, so I've explained the context in it, so why are you asking me again? Well, uh, the, the context is that you've been fined £800 for a crime that no, you yeah, committed. No, you're talking about the context of the video. Uh, and, Don't and try and, and move on. And we, we, had, we had in court... Yeah, can I just you, ask? Why we had in court that no. you committed uh -huh. uh, gross offence against uh, a large community of people. Right. Six million Jews were killed in the you, you just said the statement a couple of seconds ago. Why should I consider your context if you're not concerning mine? You've broken the law. Do you regret breaking the you law? You just broke the law two seconds ago when you said the phrase. Remember, context matters, mate.